Wow, well, these, were, uh, these were great presentations, all six. And what we'd like to do now is we have about 15 minutes. And I'd like to bring up all six speakers uh, to the front um, uh, so that we can have some period of asking questions and having discussion. Uh, and, we, and please want to use the microphone because this is being recorded. So if we can get um, Monique and Adriana and, uh, and Jim. And while we're getting uh, organized here, and, and uh, I just wanted to say, make a couple general comments. I mean, first of all, I think it's really exciting to see the breadth and depth of studies looking at adolescent decision making, risk taking, and, and I think the emphasis on these high impact public health, uh, education, uh, health issues is really uh, very important. And I also just wanted to make one general comment um, uh, at that link, which I care about a lot. And <clears throat> Jim was worried we were going to vote him off the developmental island because of his advocacy for a perspective. I actually want to invite him onto the developmental island and, and say that I think one of the most important things about developmental perspective is the trajectories often take the peak time of the pathology and the underlying process leading to that as different times. If we looked at the peak time for lung cancer, we wouldn't understand that adolescent smoking experimentation was the key time. And we think behaviorally it's simpler than it's, you know, it's not the pathophysiology, but I think there are a lot of times when the habits and the feelings and what's associated with your sense of self and what feelings you like uh, are getting instantiated that are going to have long-term effects. So I just want to say I think there's room for both saying of course the desistance later in life could be interesting from a neurocognitive point of view but I think this idea that looking at mechanisms re related to many of these talks about feelings and peer effects and social context that tip the balance for tendencies to behave and, and last to link this to the, to the point Monique made, I think we also need to think about emotional motivational learning that then it's going to shape what we like and what we don't like and how that is shaped by social experience in early adolescence that leads to patterns of behavior. And so as that, as the introduction uh, response, I want to turn it over to the questions and discussion broadly. Great series of talks here uh, this morning. This question specifically for Sarah and Jason. Um, and I know your last I, slides, Jason, says that it's not implicit cognition. But I'm wondering if social dominance or social status has mediated any of the effects you're looking at. You can just think of peer groups of, well, this is kind of my loser friend. I'm kind of cooler. Or, These are the cool kids. I want to impress them. And so I'm wondering if you're looking at that and if that, that's been able to predict anything in either of your data sets. Um, yeah, so it's something we certainly have thought about. I, I think it's quite plausible that there is some kind of role for uh, how I view myself relative to others. I can tell you in the stoplight data, we asked a very simple question, which is whether um, the adolescents view themselves as sort of the leader of their group, or they view themselves as the follower in their group, and everyone thought they were the leader of the group. The friends <laughs> thought they were the leader of the group. So, so that didn't get us very far. Um, we subsequently have been doing a study, though, where we've um, manipulated, I told you that we have this now anonymous peer manipulation, um, and so you can actually use that paradigm to toy around with the uh, assumed uh, characteristics of the viewer. So you could tell them, for example, things that make them think this person's a jock or this person's a nerd. And we looked at how that affects what kinds of decisions people are making. Um, and Ashley could tell you a little bit more about the details of that study. Um, but we are finding that the way in which peers influence them is dependent on who they think the peer is. So yes, we're looking at it. I think it's a very interesting aspect of the phenomenon. Yeah. Hi, uh, again, great series of talks, and sorry, Jason, I'm going to be asking you to answer this one as well. Um, but it, it kind of comes back to Adriana's talk about potentially sometimes risk-taking adolescents being advantageous, and maybe there are some things they do optimally. Um, and I've wondered when I've read your stoplight task paper before, you talk about the number of crashes adolescents have, but I wondered whether you measured and whether you had the results of how much money they won, and whether actually there's a point at which maybe their behavior was more risky, but they did win more or less, or... Yeah. I just wondered if you could tell me. Uh, um, so yeah, we have actually looked also, that I was very concerned that they were actually earning more reward for their behavior. Um, so one thing is important to note is that they knew they were going to get $15 at some point or could earn up to $15, but they didn't understand the contingency between their actions and that, or, that monetary reward. So they couldn't really scale it. And the other thing is we looked at the overall amount of time it took them to get to the destination. And because this is really a basically a 50-50 crash rate on each intersection, it didn't matter what their decisions were. So the overall time it took them to get to the end was equivalent for the adults, the young adults, and for the 
2015. So they weren't behaving in a more optimal way. Um, but we do have results from uh, the BART task. And it's interesting because I think Adriana brought up before, you can design that task to uh, allow it to be advantageous to be risky or to set it up so it's not advantageous. Um, and there I, we found some sort of puzzling results until we added this feature in and we understood that they're actually behaving in an optimal way. So they were getting more rewards. And of course you see more reward output when you get more rewards. So um, it's important to keep that in mind as you're designing the studies. Please. So, the, so this question is actually also for Jason. So, <laughs> so, so I know, right? So sorry. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I, that I was struck by with in, the, in the comparisons of the, the mice versus the, uh, the, the human data was this, um, this kind of idea of limited uh, resources, right? And I was wondering if you if you guys have, have thought about um, this sort of, you know, in, in, the, in the case of the mice, limited sort of you know, um, access to this rewarding uh, substance. If in, in uh, you know, human adolescence, if this sort of, if there is sort of limited social uh, capital for the that there is to go around, and if that, um, if that sort of competition for social, um, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, if, there, if there is a, if there is uh, any, any sort of, um, um, you know, thought about sort of limitations in, in the sort of the social capital that might be available in a, in a particular cohort of, of adolescents. So I, I think I can only answer this indirectly, and I'll, I'll just mention a discussion Sarah Jane and I had just before the talks today, um, which is the fact that, oh, you can't hear me, sorry, how about now? Oh, the quite, the, all right, so my, my, some, my paraphrase of Chuck's question is whether there's some kind of capacity limitation to social processing, so that what you might sort of see here is some kind of depletion of social resources, which has an impact on the, the calculus of decision making. Is that about right? Okay, um, and I can't answer the question, but what I, I do think that one interesting thing is that the mentalizing brain, or the social brain, and the reward incentive processing system, they're not nearly as connected up as I think we anticipated they would be, at least in our studies. We don't see them kind of co-behaving in response to manipulation. Um, but they're, they're both implicated in this kind of social turn that adolescents have. And so Sarah and Jane was, and I were just sort of wondering if there's a way to tie these two things together, to couple it, do some kind of social depletion or a social load, and then see if you can reduce the social phenomenon, which I think is what, what your question's about. I don't have an answer. Mike? You know, the, I mean, I think that probably you would need like another experimental control that increase arousal, yes. because you cannot say yes. that this is a social part. Right. Yeah. Actually, and related to that, um, thank you for some really great talks, and I also appreciate the focus on social goals as kind of uh, that a lot of their behaviors are actually goal consistent. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role of um, both negative emotions, potentially, and the idea of arousal and whether a social um, presence actually increases arousal and perhaps kind of also a negative emotion, too. Um, and also about the role of emotion regulation and those processes in the context of social situation. So there's someone particularly you're directing the question to? All of them. Oh. Um, maybe, I think, um, Sarah well, and Jason yeah. might have some start. Um, so, your question about um, having a control for arousal is really critical. And people are starting to do that now. I don't know whether you are, but for example, in that last study that I mentioned, Lara's study, um, we had the experimenter assessing performance and friend assessing performance. I, don't, I can't say whether they were equally arousing because we didn't measure any kind of physiological responses, but uh, participants reported that they found it more stressful having the experimenter watching them than their friend watching them. Um, but that, that is just a subject report. But more, more experiments like that where you manipulate who is watching you and someone else asked a really good question about different social groups like in-group, out-group. Uh, again, manipulating that kind of thing will get, will, you know, drill down into whether it's just generalized arousal or whether it's something specific to the, the audience, the person who's watching you. Um, yeah, and like Jason was saying earlier, I mean, my, my view is that, okay, so I thought, when I started out, I thought, oh, God, mentalizing has got to play a role in social influence. Um, you know, it's the social brain, it's the social system. But like Jason just said, there really isn't very much overlap between the mentalizing system and the social reward system, and they seem to be dissociated. And also their new experiment on mice, I mean, we don't know whether mice can do false belief tasks and mentalize the whole time, but we probably, you know, suspect they can't. Um, and yet they showed this peer influence on alcohol um, intake, so risk taking in adolescence. Um, but one thing I would say is that just because you 
you can see this peer influence on risk-taking in animals who presumably can't mentalise. That doesn't mean that animals who can mentalise, like us, and do all the time. I mean, you can't dissociate mentalising from behaviour in any situation we're constantly mentalising it's a kind of baseline state so that doesn't mean that when we are in that situation of peer influence we're not using our mentalising systems but like Jason said this is a very new area and no one has really looked at how these two things are related and yeah it would be interesting to do that Does anyone okay. else add? Yeah, we, we have a study where we look at uh, risk taking and we tell the adolescents that adolescents and adults actually that uh, there is a group of peers, their age, ge uh, gender match, um, who are watching them. So we have a video feed, uh, feed and uh, we turn the video on. We call from one room to the other. So you know, it's like some kind of, uh, the, and there is nobody, of course, but uh, it's a deception study. And we thought that we would do like Jason, we would find the same thing, you know, increase risk taking. So we got decreased risk taking. And then we had some uh, evaluation of the peers, you know, are they nice? Are they not nice? Uh, what do you think? And they thought there was like, you know, judging. And so we had the, you know, the unexpected finding. Yeah, that was like a career social that. stress test with yeah. the peers being present in some way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So it was peers, like, you know, it was the. Uh, Sure. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Ne thanks. Next question. Really interesting stuff. So I want to follow up on this idea that the adolescent brain is not broken. And I'm wondering if if the, the social influence could possibly be used for good. I can think of many situations in which adolescents engage in activities that are really positive because their peers are doing it, like spending hours in the school musical or you know studying hard so you can go to the same college that your friends are going to could those has anybody looked at positive influences and you know can we could we make it hip to be square and you know move you know take some turn this around in a positive way Okay, so that was the aim of our study when we were looking at peer influence on relational reasoning. We thought in the educational context, maybe peers watching you will improve your educational performance, but we did not find that. We found that it was a detrimental performance when peers are watching you, even for relational reasoning. But um, one of the things that yeah, Kate Mills has lots of thoughts about is that risk-taking... So, yes, adolescents seem to take risks, but only in certain contexts. In, in, at least in the UK, and I don't know what it's like here, but in the UK I work with a lot of schools, and one of the things that teachers um, really struggle with is the fact that adolescents, especially adolescent girls, are really reluctant to take risks in the classroom. So things like putting their hand up and saying something, making an argument that they're not totally sure about that isn't written in a textbook in front of them. Those kinds of educational risks, trying different food at lunchtime, hanging out with different social groups, that, those kinds of risks um, would be, you know, would benefit T teenagers in the classroom and yet they're reluctant to make them so we have in um, some London schools have like risk taking weeks where they reward these kinds of risks <laughs> to encourage them um, so it's very complex <laughs> and different risks in different situations need to be looked at not just health risks okay we have time for one more question hi thanks for all these great talks I have a question that might sound very simple about physical states. So do you collect data on how hungry these ad adults and adolescents, and adolescents are, um, or how fatigued, like how much sleep they got the night before because of the literature on you know, how you know, sleep deprivation can affect decision making and hunger, something as simple as hunger can affect decision making? So, so, so I... I uh, we collect data on the, how much sleep they had the night before, which doesn't necessarily correspond to how tired they are. Um, and so for one type of, but we didn't use it, we haven't used it yet for these uh, risk-taking studies. We use it for uh, emotion, um, you know, face viewing. And in that case, uh, there is a correlation between how much they slept the night before and activation of the amygdala, which is interesting, yeah. So I just wanted to add um, that Matt Walker's lab is actually looking very actively at sleep deprivation affecting reward uh, 
<coughs> processing a couple of students in his lab, and, and particularly in adolescence, and I think that's a very important dimension. And I also wanted to add, we talk about arousal, and, but as someone who spent a lot of years studying sleep and arousal, I mean, I think we need to parse what we mean by arousal and get back to what adolescents find rewarding, a thrill, or a surge, a sudden surge of arousal is the foundation for sensation seeking. There's a reason that kids talk about getting a rush. It's going from zero to 60 in four seconds that's thrilling. And I think if we look at what creates sensation seeking and what adolescents like, it has to do with delta arousal. And I think there's some really interesting conceptual as well as methodologic issues about how even some of these implicit social cognitive uh, processes that could increase anxiety and bursts could interact with other simpler reward system changes in adolescence that contribute to complex behavior. So I think these are great, great questions, and we need teams of people to address these. Jim has some. Yeah, I, I can, I, I just to comment about, but before I do that, um, Ron, uh, I've never met you before. I've read and loved your work. And I'm just grateful that, that when you invite me up against the wall, it's not to do this. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think arousal uh, and vigilance and fatigue could be a very important factor because, you know, as BJ alluded, most tasks find more reward uh, activation in adults, but the one that I used is almost unique in, uh, in, in not, and in finding the other direction, that adults are much more locked in in their whole brain. Um, and I think Monique has found some of that same directionality. And I think it might be because the monetary incentive delay task is intentionally rigorous. They have to make split second responses. We got these kids in the middle of their school week. And you know, that, that might be a very, very big part of it. And even looking at just time of day of yeah. the scan and if there are differences based on time of day. Yeah, and a lot of those times it was kind of in the evening when I could get time. Well, clearly we need another couple days of doing this, um, and hopefully we will be able to, to revisit. This has been a really amazing and wonderful session. I think we're just beginning to slice into some fascinating issues. I want to really thank the, the speakers and the, and the uh, questioners, uh, questioners, and look forward to more of this later. Thank you very much.